going live. Yeah. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we're going to be continuing on the joinery window. I haven't hit this in a little while. Uh, so this is a fun one. This is an interesting project that it uh, used to be something that the apprentice would do to show how they could complete all the joints and everything come together nicely. Uh, but basically it's six sticks of wood with nine different joints and each one of them shows different skills. So we're working through this one. This is from one that I did a few years ago, uh, but we are now redoing the whole project and going through it again. Um, and this is something I, I, I like to do and I want to actually do them occasionally so I can compare you know, every couple years or so to see you know, how have my skills progressed and where are we going with that. But uh, tonight we are going to be doing uh, the, the uh, well it goes by many different names, but uh, the, the half lap dovetail or the lapped dovetail. Um, it is a, a fairly simple joint, but is very strong um, in the direction it needs to be strong in. So uh, yeah, we're going to be working on that. Now, um, a few updates. Um, Actually, what updates do I have? Oh, June, MWTCA is having the national meet. It is, um, it is um, going to happen. And it is happening in uh, um, what was it? Madison. What? Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you. There's a reason I married her. She is the most of this brain. <laughs> I'm so glad we're sharing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just borrow bits from yours occasionally. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will be there. It is in June. Um, and it is by far the largest tool meet in the world. And so I am looking forward to this happening again because we haven't had one in well over a year now. Uh, but the other thing that's been happening in the shop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, oh. before we get to that. Oh, yeah. Did you get the results from the auction? Or? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, last week. Excuse me. Had a really good dinner and it's attacking. <laughs> um, we had uh, the last, last week we had the auction. Um, and then we did the auction over this weekend and um, sold off um, a bunch of pins and mallets that uh, Aaron Finn had made. And uh, we were able to, well, the money is, is still coming in because we had a couple other people who were wanting to put into it. Um, but we are just shy of enough money to actually pay for one veteran for the whole experience, traveling, the tools, the whole yards. Um, so it's, um, on average, it's about $2,500 for that. So we're right now at, I think, 2200 um, But there were two other people who were talking to me about putting some more money in, um, so we'll see. But hopefully, um, in the next couple days, I'm gonna be sending that money over. So um, thank you to everyone. It was, it was huge. Aaron and I were expecting somewhere around uh, $1,000, $1,500, but to be scratching at $2,500 is um, very, very cool. So I'm probably gonna do something like this occasionally, and I think it's a fantastic uh, opportunity and, and uh, um, cause to to do this for. So thank you to everyone for uh, donating and um, buying pins and mallets. We'll have to try something like that in the future. So um, other news, we have actually one topic we don't get to talk about that often, but Sarah's bench. Look, oh, look at this. It stands up. Look at this. Yay. It's almost as tall as she is. <laughs> it's not a tall order. So tell us, what, what, have, we, what have you done in your What bench? have we done? We, we've made the legs attach together. So we'd already done the tusk tenon. Um, we, hang on, I have to think about this. We cut this, no, these out. What are these? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me. That's a, this is the test. <sighs> what, what are those things down there? We put dowels through it, and then, oh, you told me, and I knew you were going to ask me, and I forgot. <laughs> are you talking mortise and tenon? Oh, well, that's... Or the gonna, stretchers? Well, no, but I thought you were going to ask me, like, the specific... Oh, the drawbore tenon. Drawbore yes. tenon. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Yeah, of course it's mortise and tenon. Duh, everybody knows that. <laughs> um, so we got to finish off some of this. We, we, we got to get to the detailing and all that, and it's not mm -hmm. attached at all so but yeah yeah so we got one more video on that um and my arm's gonna kill me tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we got it's it's there the top isn't actually attached to the legs so we have to attach the tops how heavy is trim it work. very yeah it's um if i had to guess i'd say the whole bench is about 150 ish well, we'll see what that's compared to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> 3.5 <Sarahs>. <laughs> If only. 
Yes, <laughs> we, were, we were talking, I was showing her the, uh, the uh, flush cut saw, and I was saying, this reminds me of you. It is both flexible and thin. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> it's a good thing you said flush cut, not flesh cut. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, uh, we are going to be making the, oh, should we bring this over here so you can guys see it? We're going to be making the dovetail. And this is one of my favorites. I don't know why. This is a, it's a very simple dovetail, um, but it is a lot of fun. So if you look here, you can see the dovetail shape there. Um, it's basically just like, uh, where's the half lap? The half lap here um, in the middle, uh, in the center of the board. However, uh, with a half lap, it doesn't constrain this way. Um, it only constrains the side-to-side -side motion, whereas with the dovetail, you get the side-to-side -side constraint as well as wanting to pull out. Uh, you don't get the constraint of it coming up, um, but uh, in this case, that is what you need 99% of the time. So we are going to be making that. But we are the 1%, now. No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as always, all of my boards are getting labeled and marked so I can keep track of them. All of the labels are on the upside. Um, and this way, I know that all of my upsides are all of the reference faces. So anytime I'm referencing off the board, it's on the side with the label. And I don't need this one and this one and that one and that one. I just need these two. So, oh, wow. Really good dinner. Oh, geez. Another <laughs> one of those nights. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a good thing you guys don't have smell of it. <laughs> Uh, for those of you following along, if you have watched the first one where we made the, the half lap joint, we're basically going to start doing the exact same thing. We're going to make a half lap and then turn that into a dovetail and then transfer that from the other board. So the first thing I want to do is I want to create this shoulder here and I want to see how far down are we going to make the cut on the board. So rather than measuring this and then taking a tape measure and putting it on here, we're going to put this board onto this board and just like that, I want to make this exact measurement. I'm going to flush it up on the back side, put some pressure down, and I'm just going to make a slight nick right here. Doesn't need to be anything massive. And then with that, I'm going to come around and I'm going to mark all the way around the board. So I'm going to reference off of light, medium, hard. I'm going to reference off of this edge here. I'm going to lift it up. And this is my reference edge because this is the sticker. Put my knife into the mark, slide up against the knife, light, medium, hard. And on this face, um, on this face, I don't actually want to cut all the way across, but I'm going to flip it back over because I want my reference off of this original side. So I'm going to put my knife into the mark. I'm just going to mark in a little ways because it doesn't need to be very deep. Then I'll lift it up one more time, keeping my fence on the reference edge. I'm going to put my knife back into the original line, slide up against the knife, Light, medium, hard. Now, that is how deep I want to cut. Now I want to see how big do we want this. And so I'm going to cut this right in half. And it really doesn't have to be in half. It can be in any side. Um, I want my fence to always reference off the side of the tape. So I'm going to turn it around. And I'm going to put my pin, what about looks halfway? And I'm going to lock it down in. I don't care if that's exactly halfway. It doesn't need to be exactly halfway. It just looks like it. And now I'm going to mark on one edge, on one end, and then on the other edge. Any questions so far? No. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat, and Sarah will collate them and keep track of them. And so now we're going to cut the cheek. Um, and the cheek, imagine a tenon is the human body, and so you have the tenon sticking up, which is the head. So you have cheek, cheek, shoulder, shoulder. And so that's a tenon. So we're going to cut down this way, and we're going to expose one cheek and one shoulder. So it's imagine half of a tenon. That's what we're making. And, oh yes, uh, great things happened. I actually sharpened my tenon saw. <laughs> so those of you who have been watching for a while, and every time I say, ooh, I should sharpen this thing, I sharpened it. And if you're on Instagram and want to hear nails on a chalkboard, oh, <laughs> that video was tortured. To but it is amazing how good a fresh saw cuts. I want to make sure I'm cutting on the back side because I want to 
Um, I want to save this piece, so we're going to stay on that side of the line. So pinch the board. Ooh, it's yeah, it's a nice saw. We want if it's catching. What you want to do is put more weight on the back horn here. You want to lift the saw up. All of the weight of the saw should be on this horn and this middle finger here. Uh, everything is balanced on that point. Nothing else is touching but the middle finger and this back horn. That is what's holding the weight. So you should be lifting it off of the saw so it's just nicking the top. The teeth aren't digging in. They're just nicking the surface. If it's catching, that means you're putting too much weight on it. You're letting the saw over control it. And that's actually really common with brass backs and steel backs because they're a lot heavier. So it tends to push down. You have to lift up more weight. But with the polymer backs, like from Veritas, it's actually a little bit easier. So I've established my cut all the way across. Actually, I'm set this camera up so you guys can see. Any questions? Ah, uh, yes. Give me one second. Uh, James Crandall asks, James, have you ever considered making an interior door as a video? You know, yeah, one of these days I'd want to. Um, but one of my rules of thumb is generally, for most sake, if I'm building an item and not just working on a particular joint or detail, I want to have a project for it. And I've just not quite had a reason to build a good interior door, like a, um, like a six panel door. It would be a lot of fun, but haven't done it yet. So one of these days. So apparently Sarah just has to ask for a six yes. panel door. I want my bedroom door to be really cool. Oh, oh, oh. Y'all, I almost stole a plane from James today. It's bad. Ooh, we're winding. Okay, here, I'm actually cutting off the line this way a little bit too much. And one of the, the things that people want to do is once they get down to that point, they want to start steering and forcing the saw to get back off that line. What you actually want to do is back up to about here, away from it, twist the saw so I'm pushing against the way I want to go, and correct the cut. Use the side of the teeth to push it over a little bit more. Correct your cut up above so that when you get back down here, you're where you want to be, rather than trying to steer it out That'll give you a cleaner fit. We have to lower, raise this up a little bit more. Yeah, I let Sarah play with my new toy. I think I lost it. Oh my gosh, it, I never thought I'd be so excited about a plane, but for little hands, it's a big difference. What is it? The block, oh, you, <laughs> Car carriage? Nope. No, no, it's a, it's a, Bread it's box? A, this. But whatever that is. I don't remember. Too many quizzes. But I was using his other... But hold up your other plane that I was using. You're using the block plane. The block, yeah, I know. That one. Oh, my gosh. It's like night and day difference for little hands like mine. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost it. It is no longer mine. It is mine. not his anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn this around and then cut down the other side. This way, I'm always looking at my side of the line. Oop, that is a really sharp saw. I love the feeling of a really good, truly sharp saw. Then it went off the other way this time. Come back and correct it. Continue down. depth a little more there we go and now we need to cut the shoulder so for this lay it down I'm gonna grab my tenon saw and that will cut cross grain even though Veritas sells a tenon saw in a rip cut format um, a tenon saw is a tenon saw if it has a cross cut tooth and so same thing here Set up on the line. Follow it across. Did I cut the right? Yeah, I cut the right side. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a short line today. <laughs> That's one of the things about this is I have six pieces of wood for this project. 
So I'm not going to I, I'm not going to make another one. If I mess up one, then the whole window has a big gap in it or joint. Um, and so it is let me say. All right, now let's learn about this and see what we need to clean up on it. I'm going to grab a chisel and I can start by putting it on one side here. Let me make sure I'm actually showing you this correctly. And then I'm going to lower it down and I want it to touch the other side before it touches anything else. But in this case, it's actually touching right here. So I've got a little bit of a high spot there. I'm going to come out here and there. Now it's nice and clean all the way across. Right here is good. I just have a bit of a hump right here. The saw went a bit straight inside. So I'm going to come back. Oof, that is... Oh, yucka lucka, that's dull. We're going to sharpen this up. So, for sharpening, usually I just do this over there. Just for video's sake, it's easier to bring it over here. And, uh, oops, some people this ends up being a whole ordeal. For me, it's just a little bit of spritz. It's just a cheap Windex on diamond plates. If you want to see which ones I use, I have links to them on my um, website. A little bit more. Just going until I feel a slight burr right on the tip. Right there. Medium. They're trying to get me to get a number one now. <laughs> <laughs> so if I bring one home from one of these meats, and then onto the strop with a little bit of honing compound on it. Well, I said that the channel will soon no longer be allowed to just be wood by right. It'll have to be wood by right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. What's mine is hers and what's hers is hers. <laughs> they were already saying <laughs> So now let's try this. Oh, yeah. See, that's so much easier. And so I'm just hitting this high spot here in the middle, going across the grain to begin with. I could come in with a router plane, but I find that the setup from that just is not worth it, time-wise. Cut that shoulder down in a little more. Get that little spur there. There we go. Now let's see what we got. Just a little bit here. There's good, there's good, there's good. Good all the way across. So now, uh, make sure, do I need to do a little bit of cleanup? Yeah, I need to do a little bit of cleanup on that shoulder. I didn't hit the line dead on, so we gotta clean that up just a hair. So I'm gonna grab a quarter inch. And I'm actually gonna undercut this. Oh my, that one's dull too. What questions we got? Um. Uh, let's see, Aaron Finesse, that's a nice router in the background. Is that the foot attachment I see too? Foot attachment? Oh, to your router. I don't have a router in here. Do you have a router plane? Well, I've got the router plane. Um, all my routers are upstairs. But yeah, Ek I don't know what router you're talking about. What's that? Ek Vietney, I don't know. There we go. Yeah, it's nice and sharp. Here, yeah, clarify, I'd like to answer if possible. So I'm going to put this right into that knife line. I'm just going to wiggle it back a little bit. I'm going to do the same thing right across the front. In the background. I want this, whoop, let me turn this over this way so you can see this a little bit better. And I'm going to start in here, take about half the thickness off. Just rip it back. About the plane. Gotta love. Okay. Oh. I got clarification on that question from uh -huh. Aaron when you What's done. that? Okay, so he says the router plane in the background had the foot attachment, and if so, does James ever turn it upside down and use it for a depth stop? Um, I don't know what he's talking about. Router plane in the background. I only have one. I do. What's that? I'm just reading. Yeah, I only have one router here and it's on the bench. Okay, Aaron. Is that Aaron Finn? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe he's talking about 
Darn on man. the Stanley plane with the open face, there is a foot attachment to make it a pseudo closed plane. Oh, yeah. Got that on here. I don't know all the planes yet. So what was his question about it? Um, do you have a foot attachment and then do you t use it as a depth stop? Um, usually no. I don't like to use my router plane as a plow plane. Um, I'd rather use my plow plane as a router plane, as a plow plane as a plow plane. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have used it once, um, but I think that was just for dem demonstration sake. So at this point, this is where things change a little bit and we are no longer making a half lap joint. We're actually going to make um, a dovetail on this. And so rather than using a dovetail key to draw it out, I'm actually going to use a bevel guide, bevel gauge, bevel guide, bevel. this thing, which <laughs> this is also a Bridge City Tools. Um, this is a kit that was made for me by a friend. Uh, so I'm gonna put this on here and I don't care what this angle is, it is whatever that angle is. I'm going to come back here to that baseline I drew earlier. We're going to do a light, especially going with the grain. We want to make sure we start very light, come in heavy, and then, or light medium, and then very heavy. Flip it over. We do the same thing on this side. Just going to line it up with this middle point here. We're going to do light, medium, very heavy. And now, we have lines that we can cut to. Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, now Sorry. you can see them. Couldn't see them before. Lines that we need to cut to. There you go. So for that, um, normally I would come in with a dovetail saw and cut that down, because that would make a really nice dovetail cut. Um, and I intentionally made them come right out to the corners. I want to show you starting on the corner. That's kind of hard. But we also need to make <laughs> cuts down in. Starting on the corner, starting at all is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Do you got another question? Uh, yes, let's see. Alex asked, are there many different types of draw knives? And if so, what are the differences besides different widths? Oh, there are hundreds of types of draw knives, um, all different angles, bevel up, bevel down, um, different folding handles, different lengths, um, different steel types. And yeah, pretty much every characteristic of it, there's one out there that has a combination of those characteristics. And most of them just come down to personal preference. Um, it's not like you use this one for bark and you use this one for rough cutting, you use this one for fine cutting. It's really a personal preference. Um, and even people who really use it and use a lot of them, there's like two or three that they use all the time. And it's a different two or three for each person just because those are the two or three that I like. So, yeah. Let us cut this shoulder down. Cut down, see that line, rotate it over, let's cut down the other one to that line, trying to be very accurate here, I don't want to come back and clean it up with a shoulder, with a knight, with a chisel, here's the word, down like that. Now, to cut that down, rather than keeping the board vertical, I'm actually going to turn the board so that the cut is vertical. And I'm going to grab my newly sharpened um, tin saw. And I'm going to leave it on the side here. So if I started it down here, I'm going to push the side against it. And I'm just going to use the side to neck in, kind of like a file. And that will create a ledge that I can start cutting from. I'm just going to do it right up here at the top. I'm going to use the side of it, kind of like a file until I get that caught. Now, you see I'm catching here, I'm bending the piece. I want to make sure I'm lifting it off. I want to lift the saw off the work so I'm not putting the weight of the saw into it. Especially when cutting thin stock like this. Putting a little bit of side pressure on it, and it 
came off. That's not a problem because we're going to come back in with a chisel. And I just want to clean that up just a little bit. Not much. And clean up that surface there. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I do want to check and make sure that this is 90 degrees and we are good. And that way I make sure that it's going to fit down in there. Now we're going to turn it and do the same thing on the other side. Any other questions? Um, so Fly Fishing Chief just asked, would you recommend a type of draw knife to start with, such as a flat blade versus concave or convex? No. Um, yeah, in all honesty, when you're beginning, it really doesn't make any difference um, because you're going to be spending so much time flipping it, rotating it, and trying to feel it at different angles that it really doesn't make much difference. There isn't a good beginner knife. Um, they're all pretty similar to that. It all comes down to just what feels good to you. Putting too much weight into it. And let the saw do the work. Sometimes even take some weight off the saw so it's not the saw doing the work. And at this point, if you're off your line a little bit, it's not a huge issue because we're going to make the, the pins whatever this is. So I'm coming through here, just cleaning it up. Making sure I slice my finger up good. Which I think I did actually hit it. Oh, look at that, I'm bleeding. <laughs> Wouldn't be a good project without a sacrifice to the woodworking gods. And there we go. So now we have our dovetail. Now we need to make our pins. And so I want to put this on here like this, but I want to know where does this go on the board? In this particular case, the thing that's important is that it's in the middle of the board. And since this is the first cross member I've done, hmm, it's bleeding quite a bit. No, it's not quite that much. As long as I don't squeeze it, it's fine. There'll be red spots appearing here occasionally. <laughs> um, because this is the first one, it really doesn't matter exactly where. I could put it off. I could make this window into um, something that's out of, out of square and making them all different. So I'd slide these over and this up and so I'd have two that are similar and one that's small and one that's big. Um, but I want to actually make them all the same. I'll make my father happy because he likes symmetry. I thought you were going to say red oak. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I need to find the middle of this board. Um, where did that stick go? Oh, I put it over there. Just what a second. For? My ruler. And, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. I'm do that. So, in this case, I need to find the center of this board. And once I've made the first one, I'll make all the rest of them match whatever this is. So if I'm out 16th inch one way or the other, it's not going to make that big a deal. So this whole board is something around there. So I'm just going to eyeball right now to begin with. Right there is where I'm going to say center of the board is. So I'm going to come over here, and that is at seven and five eighths. So I put it on this side and we are at seven and three eighths. So that means I need to go over a half inch. So I probably made this about 15 inches. And we're gonna make a mark there. And so this should be seven and a half. So there's my center mark right there. Just to clarify it up, I'll bring this in. I'm gonna draw it across, I don't really need to. I want it to be bigger than the mark that I just made there a little bit ago. Whoop. Sorry, if I turn that up a little bit. Ooh. Focus. There we go. So I got a line across the board here. Now, I want to center up where does this go on it. Uh, so I'm actually going to turn this around. And in this case, let me show you a slightly different method of doing it. Uh, so on this one, I'm actually going to take my marking gauge. And I'm going to put my marking gauge pin right about where I think middle is. I'm going to lock this down. Uh-oh. I did do that wrong. I should have kept this one the same and brought another I one. was just going to ask but oh well. about that. So I'm going to make a mark in here. And then I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to make a mark right beside it. And these two marks 
about an eighth inch apart. And so then what I can do is I can come in and put that pin right in between those. I can pretty much eyeball halfway between an eighth inch mark. So I can put that on here, just like that. Now I have a center mark on this, and a center mark on this, and I can line those two up, just like that. And I can put this shoulder and put a mark here, just nick into the corner. I'm going to do the same thing on here, reference on that, nick into the corner. Now when I turn this around, I'm going to get something to set underneath this, just to lift it up a bit, yeah, a little thicker than that. Perfect. Scrap a paduk. And now what this will do is I can line up this shoulder with that mark and this shoulder with that mark, and I know that this board now is center of the total. So I've got a mark there and a mark there. I'm going to put all my weight down on this. I take my knife, come in here, and I'm going to go light, medium, Oop, without cutting the end of the board. and hard. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Light, medium, hard. And now I'm going to reset my marking gauge that I just messed up. <laughs> and I'm going to set it to the thickness on here. Actually, just do a little less. Let's see how that came out. Perfect. Okay, now this is my reference side because it's the side with tape. I'm going to come in here and mark the depth that I just had on there. How deep down do we want this to go? Any questions we have while I'm marking on this? Let's see. Michael C. asks, I'm making a potting bench out of white oak. Would that be, what would be a good exterior finish? <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of debates about that, but it doesn't matter what finish you're doing. You're going to have to redo it regularly. Um, so, you know, a really good marine grade varnish every year, every other year, maybe three years, depending upon sun. Um, but... If you go with something light, like a, a boiled linseed oil finish, you're probably going to redo it every six months or so. Um, Osmo and, uh, not Osmo, um, oh, come on, what's the name of it? Rubio Monocoat mm -hmm. um, has an exterior finish that I really want to try. And it's supposedly pretty good um, at exterior conditions. Not pretty good, but it's, it's supposedly longer lasting than most. Um, it also has more of a, uh, looks more like boiled linseed oil. So that would be, that's the one I want to try. But for most people, a marine grade varnish is what they go with. Um, but with a potting bench, you may be thinking of food safe. Um, so you might not want to do like a deck stain. But whatever you do, just understand, you're probably going to redo it. <laughs> So we've got our marks where our dovetails are, down either face, down to the depth stop that we marked on both sides. So now we're going to come in with our shoulder plane, and we're going to cut down on both sides of that dovetail. Got a question? Um, let's see. So far, none of the questions have really been directly related to the project, just so you know. Um, Mr. Q mm, asks, blood stains. how do you like that rubber flooring you installed? Oh, I love it. It's so much quieter. More friction. Um, yeah, just all around much better. It is, it's now a keeper in whatever shop I do. <sighs> if I ever move again. Which probably yeah. someday, but who knows. <laughs> Although we're really coming close. This is, is soon going to be another year. This will be the longest I've ever lived in one place. Yeah. Okay, so make sure I stay on the inside of the line. Nice and developed. Got a 
depth on my side. A little bit more on the other side. Oh, my butt. You say your foot's falling asleep? My foot fell asleep. <laughs> so I'm probably making weird faces. Your face could never be weird, babe. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't have a mask to hide behind. You need a bit more. Oof. Okay, there we go. Now those are down to depth on both sides. I'm going to come in with my blood stealing knife and my chisel <laughs> and a good joiner's mallet and I'm actually going to start on this side and I'm going to aim up so let me position this camera so you can see a little better and what I'm going to be doing is rather than cutting straight across I'm actually going to cut up at an angle so that I'm not blowing out either side and I'm always saving a little bit in the middle because you can always come back and remove material you can't always take it away so I'm going to set in here, I'm going to come about halfway down the line, aiming up. I'm just going to chop in a ways, about halfway down. I'm come over here, about halfway again to the line. Over here, about halfway again to the line. And I'm not using the router plane yet because I'm removing off large chunks that are um, a lot more than the router plane could take. Same thing here. I should probably silence my phone. And now I'm getting right down close to that line. So now, yeah, I can't take off another half, so I'm going to put it right into that line. I'm still aiming up a bit. I'm going to go about halfway across the board. Come into the line again. And I'm actually resting the back of the chisel on the bench here so that there's a natural angle up and on this last one that's it from that side and we're going to rotate around do the same from the other side what questions we got let's see brian mitchell had asked why use a shoulder plane and not a rabbit plane but they um, are the same are they not well a shoulder Similar. plane usually has a lower angle so it's better at cutting end grain so it's better at cutting the shoulder on a tenon because the shoulder is end grain. Um, whereas a rabbit plane is generally has a higher angle because it intends to go along the grain, creating a rabbit in a board. Um, you can usually use one to do the other, um, but that's the difference between them. So, Where's my chisel? It's right in front of me. If it were any closer, it would bite me. Oh, it did. <laughs> <laughs> so again, halfway down to the line, aiming up. Come over here, halfway down to the line. Now, if I were taking off like an inch or more, I wouldn't go a whole halfway. I'd probably go no more than an eighth at a time. But in this case, I'm only taking off three eighths. So, doing a little bit more than an eighth. Halfway to the line again. Ooh, not into the line. I'm getting really, really close to that line. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit better for you. <laughs> see my bald spot? <laughs> what? Richard just said, hello, poor man. I am rich. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. Good job. We haven't had any jokes yet tonight. Oh. Right into the knife line now. And so now we're going to do the same thing again we did with the, um, with the cheeks. So if I set it on one side, I should be able to have it rock all the way across and touch the other side. But I got a big belly in the middle. So we can remove that the same way. And actually, I'm going to cut down a little bit deeper with the chisel here. So take it down a little lower with the saw I did. So that'll just make this easier. 
Normally I'd want to do this on the bench rather than bouncing in the vise, but we're running a little bit low on time. Yeah, 40, we're not bad actually. So now we can come in with that stabbing motion. And we can clean that up. Now if I really wanted to, I could grab my router plane. Ooh, yes, and I really want to because a router plane is a very fun tool. And especially in this case, this is like what it's made for because I can register off of both sides to get a really clean setting. So I'm gonna set this down and I'm going to, actually I'm gonna take this label off and move it over because otherwise I'm gonna be running into it with a router. So I'll put that back on in a minute. I'm just gonna set it over here. And I'm going to adjust my iron down until it touches at the high spot. And then just a little more, crank it down. And now, I'm only hitting this high spot in the middle. And nothing else. Now that I've done that, I'm gonna loosen it, put it down a quarter turn, tighten it up. Come around to this side. See, this is fun. A router plane is a very fun tool. Very tight, yeah, very tight. Something on here is loose. Oh, that's just loose. Okay, now, actually, I don't want to take it anymore because I'm at that knife line. I'm putting it right along the edge, and it's just nicking into that knife line. So that's actually where I want it to be. I was actually closer to flat than I thought, which is a good thing. It means I don't have to do as much work. It means Sarah didn't cut it. <laughs> Cleaning up tight against those shoulders. Now we can come in, clean out any wisps that are sticking up. So you know the will of the wisps and all. <laughs> Follow the wisps. Alex wants to know, is there any specific reason for not using a wider chisel? Um, wider chisel takes more force, and more force you put into something, the better the chance that you're going to blow out and ruin something. Um, so if I don't worry about the, the amount of force I'm putting behind it, I'll grab a bigger one. But in this case, I really want to make, a, I don't want to, I don't want the chance of blowing out something bigger. Um, so I probably could jump up to an inch. Um, I'm using a three-quarter right now. Three-quarter? Yeah, three-quarter. Um, but yeah. I could go bigger. I know, I'll turn in my man card. I didn't go bigger. So let's put this sticker back on there. Otherwise, I will forget. <laughs> and now, the moment of truth. We drop tools on the floor. This is a good sign. It means that we're doing what we're supposed to do. So now, do these actually go together? Just this, is the, this is the fun part of Wood by Right Lives, is this is reality, and I'm not going to hide anything, so you can actually see precisely what is going in, because most of the time, this does not work. Every now and then, the angels sing, but uh, probably not tonight. Ooh. Is that the Halloween for us? So while you're banging that in. Ooh, what's that? Troy Jacobson just threw up a super chat for the Coco or number one fun. <laughs> <laughs> what's the super chat? That's what it was. But you mean what's the Oh, I joke? see. Yeah. Well, thank you, Troy. No, I should say thank you. Because you're not either getting the cocoa or the number one. No, I will not. <laughs> oh, that is so close. What you got? And yes, I have an evil laugh. Here, uh, she's looking at that. I'll show you this. So this is actually really good. This side here, I'm in love with this. Perfect butter smooth across here. This side here that is a little bit high. So something is stopping this from going down all the way. However, there's a little bit of a gap on this corner. So I don't know if I just didn't hit it hard enough. Which, you know, when in doubt, brute force and violent manipulation. Let's see what happens. Nope, didn't go down. 
So that means there's something underneath this edge. So we gotta pop that apart and clean it up a little bit. So what's the mom joke? So why is marriage like a deck of cards? Why? In the beginning, all you need is two hearts and a diamond. By the end, you wish it, you had a club and a spade. <laughs> <laughs> A little tighter than I'd like, but not bad. Okay, let's make sure I'm looking at the right side. All right, I need to take off the material there. So first I want to see the tenon. Did I hit the line? Is anything sticking up on there? I honestly don't see anything sticking up on there. So, oh yeah, there's some junk in there. Here, let me show you. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not, but there's tiny wisps of junk down in here. And that is what is holding it up. This little stuff down in the corner. I'm just going to take my knife. And I'm going to clean those out. <laughs> that's all it takes. Chief just says, angels may not sing, but we're about due for, min for another burp from James. <laughs> for another what? Burp. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's happy right there. That feels good. See, now that's, that's about what I'm looking for. That's, yeah, that's smooth. Yeah, yeah, that's happy. And that's nice and smooth. That's a pleasing joint. So there is our lapped dovetail. Nice, simple joint. Incredibly strong um, in many different directions, especially with that nice and tight. You, you clamp this with a long grain to long grain. Um, that is an incredibly strong joint. So there, one more done. So we have four of the nine joints, five more to go. What questions we got? Wow, I'm glad you knew that subtraction. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I teach the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Aaron Fenn asked, I have some panel saws that I picked up at a yard sale. There is rust on the steel. How would you clean it? And if it is just surface rust, do you think it will affect the kerf too bad? You know, I used to spend a lot of time removing all the rust from my saws and making sure they're perfect. In all honesty, as long as the rust is just simple surface rust, I'm going to oil it down and put it to use. You know, a couple or a couple runs on the board, and that'll clean it up really nice like um, with some oil on there. Yeah. Um, now, if it's getting into the handle, I'm probably going to pull the handle off and make sure it's clean underneath there. I don't want any rust growing underneath the handle. Um, so I, I would do that. But if it's just simple surface rust on the main plate, oil it down to use it. And it's amazing how fast it, it cleans up. Um, yeah. Now, if I want to take off a little bit more, um, I'm either, well, depending upon the saw, if it's, a, if it's something a little more collectible and I want to maintain the value, I'll scrape it off. Uh, but most of the time, I'm just going to go at it with some 400 grit and a little bit of WD-40 or something like that. And that removes most all rust pretty quickly. Um, if it's really heavy, then I might do a bath of one kind or another. Um, uh, vinegar, if you're careful. Um, it's cheap. It works well, but you have to be careful with it. Don't let it too long and uh, um, don't run into it too much. But most of the time for me, I'm probably going to spend the money now and get an actual rust bath for it. Um, Evaporust is my favorite, though it's hard to come by around here. Um, WD-40 Specialist is actually a really good one. I like that one. Um, that one I can get around here, so yeah. And I hear a lot of people actually can get it at their, um, their Harbor Freight. Not mine. A lot of people can get it at their O'Reilly's. Not mine. A lot of people can get it at their Home Depot. Not mine. <laughs> Not bitter. <laughs> no. <laughs> What's next? Um, I don't have anything next. Really? That's all we got? Well, I think we'll wrap it up then. Unless we have something what? special. Why do we wrap it up early? Yeah, next week, um, what was the next one we're doing? Uh, let's see. We did that one. So next week, we are going to do the regular tenon, not a through tenon. Just a simple tenon. Um, a lot of videos show how to do a through tenon and things like that. We're just doing a regular simple tenon. It's going to go about halfway into the board. Um, then the week after that, we are doing the um, the drawboard tenon. Ooh, I know that one now. <laughs> and then we will be doing the full half lap, uh, which is actually rather difficult to get a really nice clean full half lap. Um, and then after that, we are going to be doing 
um, the pocket hole. <gasps> I know, I just swore. <laughs> um, but surprisingly, uh, pocket holes are actually a very old joinery. Um, they are uh, some from as early as the 1600s um, because they are very good for doing cross grain joinery. They allow um, flexibility into it. So it's actually very good for a skirt to a tabletop. And you'll see a lot of actual old bits for drilling out pocket holes. Um, and then that one, that one, that one. And then our last one is uh, the splined miter joint, which looks simple, but it ain't. It is deceptively not. <laughs> so, um, all right. That, that, I just that, that, had a couple questions pop up. So. Oh, okay. I guess we won't wrap it up then. What do we got? Uh, let's see. Dallas Hansen asks, which router plane model is that? Which rabbit plane model? Router plane model. Uh, this is the Stanley 71. Um, the, the 70 is just flat across here. The 71 has an opening that you can then fill with the mouth. Although 99.9% .9 of the time I leave the mouth full. Um, so, you know, if you have a choice between them, it really doesn't make that big a difference. Um, this is just the, the classic Stanley model. And uh, pretty. This one, I actually, um, a friend of mine found this one in the box with the tags originally. And it is a slightly later model. Uh, this is one that's actually made in England. And uh, he, uh, uh, he sold this one to me, so very, very happy. That's how you know it's a very good friend. <laughs> What's next? And then Journey North asked, how about a fox wedge tenon? A boxed? Fox. Is there a fox wedge? Maybe he meant box. Is F and B by H? Just a uh, wedged tenon. Oh, uh, no, a boxed wedge tenon. That's box. Yeah, okay. I did a video on that a while ago. Um, but yeah, I want to show that one again sometime. I don't think that would work well in this. Oop, wow, we're out of focus. Let's fix this up. <laughs> here, I got some old joints that I've done up here. And I actually have a, I have a cutaway of that one, I think it is. Yeah, that one, no. Oop. There it is. There's the cutaway. And uh, so this, this is a fun one. Um, oh, yeah, here's the impossible dovetail. I should do that one again sometime. That's oh a fun my. one. <laughs> yeah, you want to try this one, babe? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one is actually, uh, they slide, if I get the right direction, they supposedly Anything's better than working on that apart. bench anymore. Which way do they go? It should slide this way. Come on, slide for me. It's in there pretty tight, but they slide diagonally so you can actually get in there. So, yeah, this is what it looks like. And so it actually wedges out inside. So theoretically, it can't pull apart. It is constrained in all directions. And then I've got another one on this side, which is a little bit cleaner. But it's kind of fun to cut them apart so you can actually see what's inside. That'd be a fun one to do again. I've got, um, a couple of years ago, we did a, a large series of all kinds of different joints. There's a few of them I probably want to show again. Um, houndstooth dovetails and Bermuda dovetails and most all really cool joints are something dovetails. <laughs> a true newbie doing a dovetail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. You haven't done dovetails yet. No. We are going to have to do a very special video sometime of Sarah's first dovetails. This would be a good time. Good a little time. spot of glue on my bench that's sticking up. Well, What's next? after killing my arm trying to put my bench together, um, <laughs> you let's see, it's eight fifty-four. You want? There's been a couple questions with the MWTCA meet. I don't know if you want to do a quick recap or just tell them to watch the video at the beginning. Is there any particular question or? It just says, "Do you have information?" Um, you have to be a member to go to the meet, and so what they do is they send out invites to members. They don't publish anywhere other than time and location. Um, and you can find that at uh, mwtca.org. Um, and so you can become a member at the gate, um, but you have to be a member to enter. So if you show up, you have to pay member dues and then also pay your entrance. Um, and you pay for the whole weekend. Uh, you can't just come Thursday or just come Friday. You can just come Saturday, but if you just come Saturday, you're getting what's left over that everyone has already picked through. If you only come one day, 
and you're looking to buy tools, Thursday is the best day. Um, Thursday morning is absolutely amazing. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually the tailgate sale. And so imagine a large parking lot um, and trucks backed up one after another after another and just tools being sold out of the back. People throw a table out behind their truck and they sell a whole truckload of tools. And it's usually um, the lesser quality tools. In other words, the not collectible tools, which are what most users want. Uh, they're tools that need a little bit of work, um, but they're not the collectible, high-end, rare things. Um, they tend to be, you know, here's a bucket of braces, three bucks a piece. Um, we were there um, a while ago, and there was, there was a guy who had um, probably somewhere in the range of ten to 15,000 chisels. Um, and he had a bucket of carving chisels, $5 a piece. Uh, um, I haven't seen him in a while, um, but every now and then he shows up and, you know, he's got a bucket of cheap carving chisels, bucket of moderate carving chisels, and then hundreds of really good carving chisels. Um, and then he'll have a whole other bench of sets of bench chisels um, and, and great things like that. And so Thursday is usually the sale to go to um, if you're wanting to buy users. Um, now, just as a note, MWTCA is a collecting organization. They're not devoted to sale and use of tools. It just happens to have a great tool sale at every one of their meets. And if you go to a local one, uh, they're usually about half the size of a basketball court-ish. Um, and imagine that space covered in tables and then all those tables covered in tools for sale. You go to the national and it's usually the indoor is about the size of a full basketball court. Um, and then the outdoor is usually uh, like three full lines of a Walmart parking lot, um, back to front. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, a lot of tools for sale. Um, so Thursday is the tailgate, then there's a few other events. There's usually a tour. Um, uh, well, then Wednesday is actually um, t tool sales in hotel rooms. And so you can actually go hotel room to hotel room and buy tools. Uh, that's an interesting experience. Uh, Are they gonna do that this year? What's that? Are they gonna do that this year? I haven't heard, we'll see. Um, yeah, I, I kind of doubt that one would happen. But uh, um, then Friday you go inside, and usually it's a whole nother batch of tools. They tend to be a little more collectible, a um, little higher quality tools. Um, and then whatever hasn't sold Friday is then also there Saturday. Um, and then there's there's several tool talks and meets and uh, tours and other things like that. Um, it's a it's an overall fun fun time. It is geared towards education. You go there, you learn about tools. And every table you walk up to, there's like, what is that? Um, and the guy behind the table is like, oh, there's a really cool story with that. That does this. And you, you learn something about it. And you walk up to the next table, and it's like, what is that? And the guy's like, oh, yes, I've got something to tell you. And it's great. You learn so much. Uh, it is a, a fantastic, that, that's, that's why I go there now, is the learning experience. Every time I go there, every single table, there's something, I don't know what it is, and it's a chance for me to learn. And you talk to the old timers who've been going there year after year after year after year, and they're still like, yeah, I go there at every other table, there's something, I don't know what it is. It's a great chance to learn. Um, so yeah, um, MWTCA, it's awesome. <laughs> so are we gonna do a Knights of the Wide Open meetup? Uh, we will be doing a meetup at the MWTCA. I don't know when, I don't know where, um, but we will be doing a meetup at the MWTCA. It won't be at the MWTCA meet. It'll be somewhere in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so we'll be doing about that. Um, and, if, and just so you know, people literally fly from all over the world to go to this meet. Now it is the Midwest Tool Collectors Association. Most people there are from the Midwest area, um, but people come from all over the US and all over the world to go to this meet because it is the biggest meet in the world. Um, but there are other tool collecting associations, West Coast, California, East Coast, um, uh, Europe and Canada and Australia. And I have a whole list of tool collecting organizations on my website. If you go to handtoolfinder.com, that's a, a location that has every tool location I know of, every trusted online um, seller I've come across. Um, it's the total compendium of my knowledge of where to find hand tools. So. That, I hope, answered many of your questions. Uh, but I think we're about it, unless there's... Yeah, and you're not presenting. You're just, we're just going. No, um, they, they asked me to, and I said, uh, not this time. Um, but I will probably be pre-presenting in the October one. Uh, but we'll see. And I'll probably be bringing that bench. 
No. Because last time I carried this bench. <laughs> and this one's no fun to take up the stairs. <laughs> so I'll take that bench and Sarah can present. Yeah, I'll present. <laughs> <laughs> Show the auxiliary what's, what it's about. It's right what's what. <laughs> Bam, we'll increase the female population. By <laughs> cool. Well, um, anything else I'm forgetting? I don't think so. We'll wrap this one up. Um, we should be back next week. However, stay tuned. Uh, uh, we're going to be... yeah. It's going to be tight. So, I'll see. Um, so, stay tuned. We'll find out about next week. And uh, we'll do that. So, I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day.